franktalks.com. You're listening to Frank Talks Pleasures and Lifestyles. I'm Frank because I have to be. On today's show, we are talking with Annabelle Joseph. Annabelle Joseph is an author about books dealing with BDSM and a whole variety of fantasy. I'm really excited about this interview because we're going to talk to an author who has the bravery and the imagination to put fantasy onto paper, and let's get to know her right now. Welcome to Frank Talks, Annabelle. Hi, Frank. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy you're here, too. Let's start off with our first question. Where were you born? And then tell me, what events happened in your life that got you interested into BDSM and then got you interested as an author of BDSM? Uh, well, I was actually born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, but my mother and father were both from the Pittsburgh area. Um, but I, it was really just... Um, coincidence that I was born there because my father was in Vietnam at the time, so my mother was staying with her mother. What actually ended up happening is I spent most of my life in the South on military installations moving around because I was sort of raised as a military brat, but I'm actually a Pittsburgh girl originally, even though I I really only lived there um, the first couple months after I was born. Anyway, my father... um, came back from Vietnam, we started moving around the country, and I think that um, that had a lot of effect on me becoming a writer because, you know, moving around so frequently, you know, you're only in a place for a year and a half, two years, you have to pick up everything and go, and it was really stressful, especially when I was younger, um, having to make friends all the time, I was a pretty shy person, and so... um, you know, I think I started writing sort of as an outlet for, or, or sort of like as a refuge from, you know, feeling like it didn't belong anywhere. And then on top of all that, my um, father was a soldier, but he was also, um, he was an alcoholic. I mean, he was a pretty functional alcoholic, but, um, but so, you know, our, you know, the, the army life was really hectic. And then, you know, when you should have a refuge at your home, like our home life was really screwed up because, you know, my dad was kind of screwed up. So, you know, I think that those kind of things um, push me both directions. They push me toward the um, wanting to get into BDSM and, especially, you know, power exchange because it was so um, structured and it was it was so predictable, I guess. You know, when you're in a BDSM relationship, you know, Someone's the top, someone's the bottom. You negotiate what happens. And it's a very, you know, and you're secure. You know where your place is and pretty much what's going to go on. And, you know, with the writing, too, I think it was kind of a way to make sense of a life that was pretty, you know, chaotic and, and pretty unpredictable and, and lonely a lot of times, like when I had was moving to a new place. So um, I think that that, that, that pretty much thumbs up. And, you know, I've been writing since, gosh, since I could write, I started writing, you know, like little poems when I was little and little stories. And up through, like, high school, I published a few short stories and poems. And then, you know, in college, I got into, you know, other forms of writing, screenplays and plays and novels and fiction and short stories. And um, I just ended up, you know, getting so into the BDSM lifestyle and in always being into romance and, and just relationships and creating, you know, these worlds that I was like, you know, I'm going to give this a try. And I started, um, I actually started writing it for, you know, girlfriends of mine, you know, fr- you know, my other, you know, wife friends of, you know, people I knew and they would read it and be like, oh, you know, this really spiced things up with me and my husband and it spiced things up with me and my husband too. So um, I was like, wow, you know, I should, you know, so I, they kept saying, write more, write more. And I did. And then, you know, I, I finally got brave enough to show it to a publisher and the rest is history. <laughs> okay. Here's a question. At what point did you first learn about BDSM? Oh, gosh. You know, it's funny because I remember, you know, actually learning what it was and learning more about it was pretty late in life. But I remember the first time I 
So uh, I remember watching Star Wars when I was six or seven, and I remember there was this one part in the movie where, I don't know if it was a stormtrooper or Darth Vader, or somebody pushed Princess Leia down, and she kind of looked up at him, like, over her shoulder, and that that was the first time I remember being like, Ooh, that's exciting to me. You know, of course I was young, so whatever. But, but then as I grew older, I was always interested in in, in power exchange, in in somebody. You know, I was always wanted to be on the submissive end of it. So you know, I got into like around high school, I started to get interested in like you know spanking stories that you know you find little book the story of O and you find books and you kind of kind of feed you and then you know I got a little you know into college and then I started to get online and you find websites and you you learn more about it so but so as far as finding out you know what real like BDSM was I would say I was probably in my early 20s but as far as being interested in just power exchange and and that kind of thing was much, much younger that that started to appeal to me. Now, can you talk a little bit about power exchange, what it means to you, and when you started having relationships, how did you bring up the subject of power exchange? Was it something you ever discussed? Um, I think power exchange is, is, um, it sort of comes, or maybe... BDSM comes under the umbrella of power exchange, or maybe it's the other way around. I'm not sure, but for me, in my um, current relationship, it's something that I I do. I'm not one of those people that's like, I am a slave, or, you know, I am this or I'm that. It's something that, you know, we we turn it on and off as we need to. I mean, I knew that I needed that. uh, I married, and when I first met my husband, um, I told him it was probably on the third or fourth date. I said, you know, I'm really into, well, at the time, we were both kind of, you know, I said, well, I'm really into spanking and you kind of bossing me around. I had no idea. I didn't know anything about master slave or dominance and submission or, you know, I just knew that I wanted the person I was with to be in control of me and that I wanted to be able to serve or be submissive to that person. And so it's funny, but when I was searching and I would go out on dates with people, I would sense almost like a, a sixth sense of if if they were, if I got a submissive vibe from the, the guy I was with, then I would just not, you know, that's it, no. Um, and, and sometimes you would get a really dominant vibe, you know, where they, they would kind of take, you know, they would take charge of situations and they would make plans without saying, well, what do you want to do? You know, so when I met my husband, I mean, he was in the military too and he was just a very, like, capable person. He was very, um, he was very gentle and kind, but he was very dominant. I don't really know how to explain it, but I think if, if anybody who's listening is a submissive or, you know, a slave type of person, they, they probably know the thing. You just get a sixth sense. And probably it works the other way too, where a dominant, you know, whether it's a male or female, would, would sense, you know, submission in a person. Now, that was back in the early 90s that I was searching for a partner. Now, you just go to one of the many wonderful websites out there. I know I'm on FedLife.com a lot. It's this huge, there's something like 300 or 400,000 people on there. And you can talk, you can network, you can find people who have similar interests in, as far as power exchange or whatever. So now people have it a lot easier because they can search online and, and really talk to people and, and find exactly what they're looking for. But when I was looking, I didn't have that option, so I just kind of had to you know, sense out, you know, is this going to be somebody whose needs might match mine? And I don't know, with me and my husband, I think we got pretty lucky because, you know, they did end up, even though we didn't know what we were doing when we started, it ended up, you know, being a really great relationship that kind of grew and changed, but our needs were always, you know, he, he always had dominant needs and I always had submissive needs, so even when we changed and you know, sometimes we do more, sometimes we do less, but we always kind of meet each other's needs. So Now I have to ask you this as a person who identifies herself as more submissive. Have you ever met anyone that when you told them, yes, I enjoy being submissive in this type of structure, 
has anybody ever given you any uh, problems with that? Has anybody ever given you any flack? And have you ever been on the receiving end of someone saying, well, no, you should be the dominant one? Um, you do. I mean, to, to be honest, I don't tell a lot of people that I'm submissive, but it is kind of, um, just this past weekend, my parents were here at our home, and so you always feel kind of like, you know, and I do a lot of, of things, you know, mindless things that I just, it's just become a habit with us, you know, as far as serving him or, you know, acting a certain way around him, so you do kind of wonder, because my mother was like the uber feminist, you know, she grew up in the in the movement of the 60s where the women were burning their bras and so you know I think sometimes she thinks like what is going on with her but I think that people see that with me and my partner that we're so attuned to each other you know we we just our relationship is so smooth and so easy that I think people don't criticize I think if I was unhappy or if I seemed unhappy or if I seemed frustrated it might be different, but, I mean, people just kind of see a, a harmonious marriage, so I think that they don't. But I'm trying to think if I've ever actually, I've told a few close friends, and they, I think they just accept it because they see that I'm happy. So, but I can see where, I, I mean, I do worry sometimes that people read my books and, and they would, say, you know, oh, this is a doormat or, you know, so I try to, when I'm writing, I try to explain, you know, it's being submissive or being somebody, somebody's slave, it's still a choice, and I mean, it's still a need being fulfilled. It's not being a doormat or being, you know, taken advantage of. It's something that these people very much want, and, and a very many people work very hard at it. I mean, harder than I work at it. I mean, there are people who just really, it's their whole life, and it's what makes them happy, so... In your experience, would you say that the majority of the women you've met enjoy being submissive, or do you think that more women prefer the more dominant role in the power exchange? Oh, we were talking about this the other day on one of the chat boards I'm on, and I think the, I think the consensus was that more women are submissive and more men are dominant, but... There are also uh, a lot of dominant women and submissive men, and we were wondering if maybe there were actually more dominant women and submissive men, but that they are not as likely to be vocal and come out and talk about it because it's more of a social stigma to be, well, at least to be a submissive male. Um, and there are also, you know, there are um, switches who do both. I mean, depending on their mood, you know, I feel like being the top today, but I feel like being the bottom this other day. And so I've always had a lot of, I always thought, well, that would be great to be both because then you could have the fun of both worlds. But I'm just not, I feel I'm not wired that way. I just have always uh, felt, you know, submissive. And but I, I would say that the majority are women, but that there's, I mean, I've met a ton of, of great um dominant females that are just really, you know, awesome and interesting, too. So it's a pretty pretty diverse world out there. And then you have, of course, you have same-sex couples where you have, you know, a dominant woman with a submissive woman or a dominant male with a submissive male, et cetera. It's just a thousand constellations mm -hmm. in the BDSM universe, really. Just to make it clear for our listeners here, have you ever experimented with being the more dominant and what is it about it that doesn't fulfill you since you identify yourself as a submissive? Um, I never have actually, uh, I'm teased sometimes because every so often I'll just have a little hissy fit or whatever, you know, online on the, on the BDSM boards. I don't have a lot of real life BDSM friends. So when I talk about talking to people, it's usually online. But, um, so sometimes people say, you know, oh, Annabelle's being toppy or, you know, the Dom, you know, the Dom, D-O-M-M-E is the female spelling of, of of Dom. See, the Dom in you is coming out. But um, I just really, I've never tried to top anybody, and I don't feel like I'd be very good at it. But I'll tell you why I think I'm wired so strongly on the submissive side is what I had mentioned earlier about having the, the crazy household growing up. And I think I've, it's always fulfilled that need of mine to feel 
like protected or safe or secure, you know, whereas I think being a dominant is really a lot harder because, you know, the submissive party just does as he or she is told. The dominant has to know, first of all, he has to know what to do to keep the submissive party happy or else he ends up without a submissive party to dominate. And second of all, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very, you have to be really knowledgeable and really careful because, you know, in a lot of cases you're playing with heavy stuff. I mean, you could be playing with pain, you could be playing with, you know, you know, really scary things. So uh, being a dominant is just seems really hard to me. Maybe I'm lazy. I don't know. I, I think there's a burden that comes with any sort of leadership, and a dominant personality has to lead or has to oversee and take care of the submissive. And any time yeah. you take on responsibility for someone else in any way, there's an added pressure, there's an added burden. Not everyone feels comfortable with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think there are those people who love the authority of it because they feel more comfortable being the responsible one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it all depends, you know, what you're looking for. And most people, I mean, there are, there are some switches, but most people lean one way or the other pretty strongly, you know. You're listening to Frank Talks Pleasures and Lifestyles. We'll be back right after this. Frank Talks is sponsored in part by Everything Out of Her Mouth is a Test, a man's guide to the emotional needs of women. Ladies, do you want the man in your life to understand you on your level? Do you want your man to be able to listen to and address all of your emotional needs? Show him how much you really want your relationship to be the best it can be. Everything Out of Her Mouth is a Test makes a perfect gift. The book written by a man, for men, is it endorsed by every woman that reads it. This book is a guide for men to understand exactly what a woman means when she speaks. Is that worth changing your life forever? Buy this book at franktalks.com now. Would you like to sponsor Frank Talks? Visit www.franktalks.com and contact Frank because he has to be. Sponsorships are always welcome, whether it's prize giveaways, parting gifts for our guests, studio equipment, accessories for the Frank Mobile, or a host of other wonderment. Help Frank Talks make the world a better place, one interview at a time. Frank Talks is sponsored in part by the book, I'm a Man, That's My Job, The Philosophy of a Seducer. Ladies, have you ever wondered where all the real men have gone? Do you turn to your woman friends because you cannot find a true man in your life? Do you want the man in your life to step up and know what it means to be a man that can make you feel like the woman that you are? Are you tired of mothering the men you date? Give these boys the gift of manhood. The book, I'm a Man, That's My Job, teaches men to create their own seduction persona personal inner game, and how to take the lead in a relationship. Buy this book now at franktalks.com. You're listening to Frank Talks Pleasures and Lifestyles. I'm Frank because I have to be. Today we're talking with Annabelle Joseph. Annabelle Joseph is an author of books relating to BDSM. Welcome back, Annabelle. Thank you, Frank. All right, Annabelle, can you tell us about your books? I want to know what the titles are, what each book is about, what inspired you to write them, are any of them based on your real-life experiences? I want to hear everything. Okay, gosh, let me think. But let me start at the beginning. I started with um, a couple of books. Uh, the first one was called Mercy, and the second one was called Oni Wednesday. And um, Mercy was about a dancer and she doesn't realize that she's uh, submissive until she meets a man. And I was talking earlier about how you get that sense that somebody's dominant or submissive. Well, she gets a sense from him that he's dominant, but she's she's not into BDSM, so she doesn't really get what's going on. But she's got this, you know, she's attracted to him so strongly. And he, of course, you know, being the very handsome and intelligent dominant he is, um, sort of pegs her as a submissive. So he goes after her, and they start a really, um, you know, intense relationship. I mean, they try it, and, and in a lot of my books, what happens is um, the same thing happens in Owning Wednesday. The, the dominant and submissive, a lot of times when people do BDSM, 
they try to keep it, well, like I said, it's structured, there's negotiation, but they try to keep it impersonal. A lot of people say, well, I just want to play. You know, I don't want a relationship. I just want to play. I just want to exchange power. Then we'll, you know, we'll go our separate ways. We'll meet once a week, whatever. You know, people will have play parties where they'll just, you know, play with somebody and then walk away. So in my books, a lot of times that's how it will begin. And then over time, they start to get an attachment. And that's so big to me is the romantic attachment that can develop between people. So that was the whole, you know, and that really all crystallized for me when I wrote these these first two books. Um, Owning Wednesday is a very popular book with a lot of people because it has a really, you know, it's very, it's just, they get very emotionally attached and the ending is this big, you know, people have said, oh, you know, I cried. And that was a big thing for me because I was reading a lot of erotica where I was getting turned on, but it wasn't doing anything for me emotionally like I didn't feel anything for the people I didn't really have any reason to keep reading except to get to the next sex scene which you know is is all well and good but you know I can go look at porn if I want to and so it takes a lot less time so what what I my goal in all my books has always been to take it that one step further I mean to make it hot and sexy and exciting but to really make people care about the characters so I kind of you know I cut my teeth on those two books then I wrote a third book called Kate and the Devil that is kind of unusual it's based back in the middle ages but it's a BDSM it's a power exchange book I guess it's not exactly like collars and chains and things because they didn't have it back then but um but again it's just it's people you know, starting out in a BDSM relationship, but realizing that that connection, because it takes so much trust and so much, you know, emotion to connect, you know, in that way. So, uh, so those are my first three, and then my fourth one was about it's about a, a a movie star. I write a lot of books about people in the arts, like dancers, painters, movie stars, things like that. Um, so this movie star decided that he he wanted to have a submissive to go on this long shoot with him, this movie shoot. So he hired a girl to do it. And uh, again, they try to keep things just you know by the contract. You know, they're not he's not going to get involved with her. She's not going to get involved with him because she doesn't want to get her heart broken. But of course, by the end, they're just completely head over heels for each other. And that's the really wonderful thing about um, when you write a romance book. You kind of there's there's a formula, and it's not a negative formula. It's it's a formula that makes women happy. You're going to start with your your hero and heroine, or you know if you're or if you have a hero and hero and a hero and heroine, however you know what whatever you're writing. But you're going to start with your two people, and they're going to you know they're going to meet, and that's always exciting. And then some you know they're going to find an attraction to one another, but then all this stuff's going to happen so that, you know, things start to go wrong, there's tension, and then, but you always know you're working for happily ever after, and I just really like that about romance, and so that's, you know, why, I think why I've written, why I'm so, I just always want to write another book because I always get the story in my head and I want these people to find connection and happiness. So, and then I've got two more books coming out. Um, one on June fifteenth is called Firebird. It's about a dancer and a choreographer. I love. I just really love dancers. And then I have the the. I have one coming out at Laura's Cave called Deep in the Woods, and it's a, it's probably the darkest thing I've written because it's about um, a BDSM relationship that went totally wrong. I don't know if we, we could probably talk about this for a while, but, um, you know, it started as a BDSM relationship, but it turned into an abusive relationship, and she's kind of coming out of it and trying to find her way with a, a new dominant and just to find her way back after being in this relationship that just really went awry. I have to ask you, and this is the, for the benefit of our listeners who are very new to BDSM, and you Mm -hmm. don't know the answer to this question. What is the difference between being in a BDSM relationship and being in an abusive relationship? 
Well, see, that's the thing. That's the whole reason I felt moved to write this book, because in many instances, people don't can't find an agreement about that. I mean, if you go on the BDSM boards and, um, you know, the various chat boards and groups and things, you'll find people arguing about, is that abuse or is that just kink? I mean, there's... Um, you know, there's so many different schools of thought, you know, and, and some people, um, they practice what's called SSC, which is safe, sane, consensual. So as long as what you're doing is safe, sane, and consensual, then it's fine, but that anything else is not. Then there are other people who practice something called RAC. RAC is an acronym for Risk Aware Consensual Kink. That means that it's not always safe, it's not always sane, but you're aware of the risks and you're doing it anyway. So, And some people will say, well, that is wrong, 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 but other people will say, you know, if I want somebody to nail my boobs to something, then that's my right, you know, who are you to criticize me? And then there are people who practice something called consensual non-consent where they say, okay, I give this person complete control over me, he or she can do whatever they want, and I've given them consent to blanket consent. And so then, and and you have these schools where people are like, that's wrong, you're crazy. But, you know, there are people who practice all these different kinds of ways. Now, in this book, it was somebody who was in kind of a, uh, a relationship where they started out consensually, but he kind of knew how to manipulate her. Because this is another thing. There are a lot of predators that will come to BDSM because they think, well, I'll find a little subby and I'll get to do all these things that other women won't let me do. And a lot of subs are, just, you know, they have a really strong drive to please. So they get in these relationships where if you get a bad pairing of somebody with no self-esteem and no brain and somebody that's a predator, then you can have a really, really bad situation. So so that's what kind of made me write the whole book, but I don't know if I ever really answered the question because the line is different for everybody. I mean, I know where my lines are, and most people know where their lines are, but I think when people don't know where their lines are, that's when it can turn into abuse. Can you tell me where your lines are and how you came to those boundaries? Oh, where are my lines? I, For me, my line, I'm not a heavy pain person. So my lines are I want what I'm doing to fulfill me. And it sounds funny that some people might not have those lines, but some people don't. Some people want to fulfill the other person. They don't really care much about themselves. But for me, it, it, I want my lines are I want it to be enjoyable to me and my partner. I want it to be exciting, and I want it to turn me on. And that's another thing. Not everybody does um, BDSM for sexual reasons or to get turned on. So, it, and this is one of the things I learned later. This is I always for me I always thought it was connected with sex, but apparently it's not. But um, for me, you know, it has to be pleasurable. It has to promote harmony between me and my partner or I'm just really not interested who are these books for if you had to pick a demographic is it for BDSM beginners are we looking for BDSM experienced practitioners who would be the best reader for your books I think the best reader is is going to be somebody who is into um who, who likes love and romance with their BDSM. And I, you know, I have a lot, I know from just my publisher and from reading emails, I have a lot of readers who are vanilla, as we say. They don't practice BDSM. They, their husbands don't even know that they have these fantasies or their boyfriends or whoever. And they, and they don't really want to live out the fantasy in real life, but they want to read it because, you know, it's, it excites them. And, you know, it, it build, you know, it builds spice into their life. So I think I want to write it for people to, for them to just enjoy and to, you know, maybe get, you know, if, if the spark has gone out of a relationship to maybe kind of 
light that spark again and have them look at their partner and say, you know, I'm turned on, let's try this, let's try that, you know. And none of the kink in my books is really like far out stuff. I mean, it's stuff that that wouldn't freak out your average, even vanilla person. You know, it's spanking, there's some, you know, some hardware, but not not like serious hardware. Um, there's no like really scary you know, edge play stuff with like guns or knives or anything. It's just, it's really, it's romantic, it's erotic, and it, it's, it's, it's for people who love connection and love with their BDSM. Okay, here's a question for you. If you had the love, the connection, the affection, the romance, but not the BDSM element, would it still be satisfying? For me or for... For you specifically me. as it relates to your lifestyle. Um, no, I mean, I think long term, no. I mean, on the short term, I mean, there are times when me and my husband put it away. Like, we don't, every time we're connecting, it's not always, it usually is, but not always. Like, we can connect without the BDSM. And I, I've always felt like that was important. I guess because when you grow older or you might change or you might lose interest, you'll still want to have some other connection with the person. But, I mean, could I live without it? Would I be happy without it? Probably not for very long. How much time do you spend writing and concocting the plot line of each book? Oh, gosh. Um... The books take about, I was telling somebody else about this, uh, what happens a lot of times is I'll write a few chat. I'll get an idea, I'll start writing the book, and then I'll stop about six chapters in, and I, because I'm not sure where I want it to go, and then, or because I've gotten another idea that I want to start on to. So sometimes I'll have three or four books open. But once I really get into a book and start writing, I, I'd say probably they take about three or four months to finish. And that's writing, I only write maybe on a good day, I might write three hours. I might write like 4,000 words on a good day. If I'm having a, like a super day when I'm totally inspired, I might write 8,000 words. And the books are about, you know, 60,000 words or so. And some days I only write 200 words or I don't write at all. So it's kind of, I'm very lucky in that, you know, I'm a supported writer. You know, I'm sort of a kept woman here at my house. So, I mean, I don't have to churn out, you know, a book every month. But, um, I don't know, I try to do three or four a year. And if my inspiration level is really high, I'll write a lot more. And if it's flagging, I'll take a break because if, I, if I'm not feeling inspired, then the writing is really awful. But luckily, I, am, I, I try to stay inspired. I try to talk to people. I try to get to know as many people in the lifestyle as I can. And I'm telling you, I get so much inspiration because I've been married to my husband for almost 11 years. So, I mean, we, you know, we have our fun, but we, you know, we, we've done almost, you know, we don't do a lot of new stuff after 11 years just because we found what we like and that's what we do. But, you know, I'm exposed to stuff on FetLife and all these other message boards that I never would have thought of. And it's so great to talk to somebody and be like, oh, wow. Or, you know, even somebody like, you know, has an interesting career or they have an interesting outlook on PDSM that is something that's just not in my little world here. So if I didn't have that exposure to other people's experiences and fantasies and the things that they do, then I I really wouldn't have as much inspiration as I have. So I'm really thankful for I would think about if if we didn't have the internet, like I wouldn't be nearly as prolific a writer probably. <laughs> One last question before we go to commercial break. How much that goes into the book is based from directly your imagination, your fantasy, and is there anything in your books that is based from your real life experiences? There definitely is stuff in there from my real life experience, um, and it's funny because 
when my husband reads them, he he sees he'll he'll find the parts. He'll be like, "Oh, you took this from this," or because sometimes I'll take exact you know th- real actual things from our life and put them almost verbatim in the book, just because it's so easy to do that. It's fun because you you know you can it's there in the book and you kind of have it forever. But but there are just as many things that um are completely made up. You know, people, a lot of people, times people ask me, well, did you ever do this or did you ever do that? And I'm just, I'll never tell. But, you know, I, I it certainly isn't all like my own personal experience. But a lot of it, the characters, especially the first two books I write, and they always say this about writers, that the first couple of books you write, it's definitely the first one, a lot of times the protagonist is, based a lot on yourself first two which was mercy and owning wednesday a lot of what was in those books um it was almost me working through some issues i had and you know if if you read them you can almost you know what i was talking about with the alcoholic father i mean he's in one of the books and you know just experiences you know the um one of them is is a rape victim, and so these are all experiences you have that you you work through them, and you're okay with them. But you have this kind of understanding of the psychology of it. So you know, in a lot of ways, that that really came straight from my life, but fictionalized. You know. You're listening to Frank Talks Pleasures and Lifestyles. We'll be back right after this. Frank Talks is sponsored in part by From Loser to Seducer by Frank B. Kermit. Ladies, is there a man in your life that got dumped for being clingy, needy, or was told he was a loser, but you still think he's a nice guy and want to help him? He could be a relative or even a friend, and you know he needs the help. Do you want to be the one to give him the gift that will change his life forever? How about the gift of a great biography? Buy him the book From Loser to Seducer by Frank B. Kermit. It is the story of a nice guy who triumphs over his inner demons to find his own hidden power. Help a nice guy in your life discover his inner seducer to find his soulmate. Buy this book now at franktalks.com. You want to learn new things? Want to meet new people? Want to discover real possibilities? Listen to Frank Talks, pleasures and lifestyles in making the world a better place. Be sure to visit our website at www.franktalks.com for the most update information and the latest downloads of programs just like the one you are listening to now. Guys, does your bachelor pad look as frightening as an Elvis convention? Then you need the Pimping Your Pad Seminar. Do you own a twin bed and still love your Star Wars sheets? Then you need the Pimping Your Pad Seminar. Is the only source of artificial light in your bachelor pad the bare, dusty bulb hanging from the ceiling? Then you need the Pimping Your Pad Seminar. Do your friends walk into your apartment and think you have been robbed? Then you need the Pimping Your Pad Seminar. Do you think that minimalist means barren as the Gobe Desert? Then you need the Pimping Your Pad Seminar. If your bathroom is home to a colony of anything, then you need the Pimping Your Pad Seminar. The Pimping Your Pad Seminar and Telephone Consultations, only available at franktalks.com. You're listening to Frank Talks Pleasures and Lifestyles. I'm Frank, because I have to be. Today we're talking with Annabelle Joseph. Annabelle Joseph is an author of books dealing with BDSM. Welcome back, Annabelle. Thank you. Annabelle, I want you to tell me what are the pleasures that you experience as a BDSM fantasy writer? Oh, gosh. I just love everything about writing BDSM romance. I just love, I love creating, like, the scenarios where they meet and where they um, work through the relationship and, you know, finding these characters that just fit together so perfectly. And the really nice thing about writing it as opposed to living it if you all you know you the characters on the page you know almost always end up perfect for each other i know in real life it's it's people are probably like ah, it's not that way for me but you know you, you keep looking and you hope for the best but um i really love just 
making that moment, the moments happen between them. And I love, you know, when people write to me and say, gosh, you know, your book was so original or it was so, you know, hot to me. And a lot of times people, because I don't have a lot of books out there yet, people write to me and say, you know, write more, write more. I just found you and I, I really love your books and you need to write more. And it just makes you want to just never stop, you know. So I really love that. I love, you know, I'm waiting right now for... um to get my covers. I have two books coming out in the near future, and, you know, the publisher now makes my covers. My, my books at Lulu, I had to make my own covers, which was fun, but now, that you know, professional artists work on my covers, and it's just like, ooh, this is exciting. What are they going to come up with, you know, and getting to show it to everybody, and I don't know, it's, it's really, it's a lot of fun, and it's fun for me to, to just be able to to even do this at all. I mean, I know so many people, they don't have the time or they just don't have, you know, the ideas or they're just too afraid to try it. And I'm just, I'm just glad that I got to this place where people supported me and, and where I can do this kind of work. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the sacrifices you have to make in order to do your profession. Well, um, for me personally, we're kind of um, closeted uh, practitioners of BDSM. I mean, we live in the Bible Belt, and we live out in the suburbs, and um, we have children, so um, we can't be completely out in the open about it. So um, I have a lot of friends who, I mean, they wear collars 24-7. You know, all their friends are kinky. They pretty much, you know, completely out there with it, and we've never been able to be that way. And, I mean, it's not a huge sacrifice because, like, you know, I love my family and I love every, you know, all the things that we have. But um, it would be it would be nice if we could be more open about it. Uh, when, you know, whenever I have a new book coming out, I would love to just share it with everybody in my family and, you know, post it on Facebook or whatever. But, you know, I can't. It's a big secret, you know. My, Annabelle Joseph, of course, is my pen name. And my real name is a big secret. Nobody knows my pen name. Uh, my brother-in-law discovered my pen name by accident uh, a few months back. And it was this, you know, big, oh, you know, I was like, please don't tell anybody. And on my husband's side of the family, they're much more open. But um, my side of the family is very conservative. And so, um, yeah, it was. It's, that's really one of the drawbacks is that people just don't – it's just not – really accepted, you know, very widely by people. And also, like you brought up earlier about uh, being open, like I can't be open with a lot of, like the moms at the bus stop, I can't really talk about, you know, my adventures as my husband's submissive or, you know, sometimes, you know, they'll say, well, let's go do this. Well, I mean, I have to call and ask for permission. So they're kind of looking at me like, that's weird, you know, and so that part of it can be a drawback, too, where you feel a little isolated because um, unless you're around a lot of other kinky people at the time, you feel kind of isolated that, that they don't really understand how your your dynamic is. So that's um, pretty much, a, you know, a draw. And, you know, just the stigma of being, a, you know, a sex, you know, sometimes my husband um, teases me about my, my porn writing, <laughs> but... Um, it is, you know, it's writing porn, but I try to do it well. So I try, you know, I try to hold my head up about it and not feel like stigmatized and, and dirty and all those kind of things. So. Speaking of the stigmas, what are other obstacles that you have to overcome in order to write in this profession? Um, I think, well, another obstacle that a lot of people face is just their own, you know, you have to be able to write and not think about what people, you know, people judging you. Like when you brought up earlier about, you know, how much of it is your is your reality and how much is made up. And you can't be self-conscious about it. You can't be like, oh, someone's going to read this and I'm going to be embarrassed, you know. So that, that's part of the, the, you know, overcoming the stigma and just and I told my family you know they know I'm a writer and I said well the reason I can't tell you my pen name is because I could not if I knew that you were going to go out and buy one of my books and read it I could not write what I write as freely so that's something that you just if you're going to become a writer like this you have to 
be able to get past that that stigma. And that was a big step for me, but I'm I'm getting there. And the other thing is you have to you have to realize you're going to get criticism because I mean there are a lot of people in the BDSM world. I mean as my name gets out there more. I mean some people like the area I write in, the, you know, safe, sane, consensual, and the romance and the love. But there are a lot of people who are really down on it. They're, they're like, ugh, romance is so stupid, and I don't want love, you know, love is so, you know, you make it so smarmy, and blah, 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 and I like my tough BDSM. So, you know, that's, you have to understand that you have a niche, and that not everybody is going to fit in there. It's the same, I mean, I don't write, really, I don't write master slave. So a lot of master slave people think my stuff is pretty soft because, you know, I'm not in the hardcore, like, you know, hardware and chains and really heavy abuse. So, I mean, for, you know, for some people, my stuff is not interesting to them for that reason. But then, you know, I have my other, you know, my people who, who love my love and romance and my fun because my characters have a lot of fun with BDSM. And so, you know, you, you get your audience and you have to, tune out the naysayers and not, you know, write where you don't, you're not inspired to write. Cause I mean, I could, I could probably write, uh, hardcore master slave, like non-consensual stuff, but it, it would be really, I think, wooden for me to do that because it's just not what I feel, you know. One of our last questions. If you could go back in time and give yourself some advice, what advice would that be? Uh, hmm. I think, I think I would, um, I wish I wouldn't have been so timid. You know, it took, it took so long for me to reach a point. I'm sure this had to do with how I grew up and, you know, it wasn't really until I met my husband that I kind of felt like, okay, you know, I had a, some security where I felt like I could come out and be myself. I mean, I hid for so long. I hid, like, my desires, and I hid my feelings, and I hid my fantasies, and I certainly never showed anybody my writing until it was just a few years ago that I finally got up the bravery to even show it to somebody. And I wish, you know, I wish I had done it sooner. I'm almost 40 now, and I think, well, if I had started this when I was 30, I could have, you know, 20 books out by now, but... um I guess I would just, you know, tell, told myself to go for it a little earlier, but I'm one of those people that feels like things happen when it's time for them to happen. So it just, back then, it just wasn't my time. I just wasn't ready. But, you know, I wish I had been a little less timid back then. Can you give us your website, your email, whatever contact information so that anyone who's listening right now will want to go visit your website and buy your books. Oh, sure. Um, my big website that I just revamped, and everybody has to go look at it because it's really cool, it's um, annabellejoseph.wordpress.com. So if you go to my website, I have, you know, or you could just Google Annabelle Joseph and it all comes up. But um, I just, you know, I set it up with a lot of tabs and it has, um, you know, links of really popular BDSM sites and, you know, resources. And I have um, contact information there. I have, you know, book blurbs of all my books, like even things that I'm still working on that aren't out yet. And I even have on my website, it's really cool, it's called the Hall of Hotness. And so what I'm doing is I'm asking all my really hot, sexy friends if I can take, you know, take their photos and um, put them up on my Hall of Hotness. So there's all these really great, you know, BDSM-inspired photos, and um, I, ha I have some celebrity photos, too, of celebrities that inspire me. So a lot of my friends enjoy going there and looking at my um, Hall of Hotness. And But, yeah, everything's on that one site, and from there you can find my different books and, you know, read the blurbs and see what interests, you know, whatever interests people. So I hope everybody will go take a look. Just for those people who are going to take it down, can you spell Annabelle Joseph? Oh, yes. It's spelled A-N-N-A-B-E-L. There's no L-E on the end. It's just A-N-N-A-B-E-L-J-O-S-E-P-H. It's AnnabelleJoseph.wordpress.com. 
Fantastic. Annabelle, it's been absolutely great having you on the show, and I sincerely hope that when you release a few more books, you'll come knocking back and saying, hey, Frank, I want to be on Frank Talks again. (laughs) Oh, I would love to. It's been my pleasure. It was really fun. This really was great. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Frank. You're listening to Frank Talks, Pleasures and Lifestyles. Goodbye, everybody. Would you like to sponsor Frank Talks? Visit www.franktalks.com and contact Frank because he has to be. Sponsorships are always welcome, whether it's prize giveaways, parting gifts for our guests, studio equipment, accessories for the Frank Mobile, or a host of other wonderment. Help Frank Talks make the world a better place, one interview at a time. Frank Talks is sponsored in part by the book, I'm a Man, That's My Job, The Philosophy of a Seducer. Ladies, have you ever wondered where all the real men have gone? Do you turn to your woman friends because you cannot find a true man in your life? Do you want the man in your life to step up and know what it means to be a man that can make you feel like the woman that you are? Are you tired of mothering the men you date? Give these boys the gift of manhood. The book, I'm a Man, That's My Job, teaches men to create their own seduction persona personal inner game and how to take the lead in a relationship buy this book now at franktalks.com frank talks is sponsored in part by everything out of her mouth is a test a man's guide to the emotional needs of women ladies does your man squash your inner vixen when you ask him to repeat what you have just said to him does he look at you like a deer cod in the headlights Does he think that leaving the game on while you talk to him is a good idea? Is his favorite phrase, yes dear, you are absolutely right. Does wife or girlfriend mean boring and dull to him? Ladies, don't you wish that he knows what you mean when you ask him if you look fat? Then you need to buy him the book, Everything Out of Her Mouth is a Test, A Man's Guide to the Emotional Needs of Women. On sale now at franktalks.com. Need help with love, sex, dating, or relationship issues? Help from Frank Kermit, the best-selling author and Canada's most international relationship coach, is only a click away at franktalks.com. What do you do when you feel like a fool? When your heart has been broken again? Pick up the phone or get onto Skype and talk on a private session. Yeah, get a little help from Frank Talks. Whoa, whoa, get back with a little help from Frank Talks. You gotta try a little help from Frank Talks. What do you do when your love goes away? Try coaching one on one. How do I sign up to turn things around? Just sign up at Frank Talks. Rate going around. Results.
Yes, we're certain. Just read the reviews. Find those up and find some others. Good love can soon come to you.